Hello, and welcome to episode 39 of the Women in Manufacturing's Hear Her Story podcast. My name is Allison Graylis, president and founder of the Women in Manufacturing Association. In today's episode, I talk with Jeanette Hostetler, vice president of manufacturing at Toyota's largest manufacturing facility globally, Toyota Kentucky. Throughout her career, Jeanette has overseen the startup and development of production systems, supplier support, training for more than 3,000 team members, and much more. Jeanette is also a champion of diversity and inclusion initiatives and has made a significant effort to inspire future women in manufacturing through mentoring and dedicated servant leadership. Her impact and accomplishments, along with her nearly 24-year career with Toyota, led her to be honored as a 2023 inductee into the Women in Manufacturing Hall of Fame. Please join me in welcoming Jeanette to the Hear Her Story podcast. Welcome, Jeanette. Thanks, Allison. How are you doing today? I am well. I'm so happy to have you here today and to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you about your career and to learn more about your story. Well, thank you. I'm absolutely honored to be here. Thank you for asking. So our podcast, you know, our design is to to talk to outstanding women in manufacturing, to which you, of course, are one of those, and also <laughs> an honoree and inductee into our Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our hope through this podcast is that we inspire and inform listeners about careers in manufacturing, individual women's journeys in manufacturing, and as well, mm-hmm. um, you know, providing them advice around how to be successful and to thrive in the manufacturing space. So we're happy to talk to you about your story. Well, I'm so glad that Wim does this. And, you know, when I look back at my career, I wish I had something like this myself. <laughs> and it's nice to to be able to help give back, I always say give back my story to many of the ladies and maybe some gentlemen that are out there too, through Wim. So I think it's fantastic that you all do this. Thanks so much. Thank you. So as we talk about your career, I'm sure you've had an interesting start <laughs> as we all kind of start our, our journeys. We just yesterday re- released the report or did a webinar on our annual research we do around careers in manufacturing and still present day, you know, the bulk of people fall into manufacturing or it's not a career by design. Mm-hmm. So we'd love to hear your story. You know, how, where did you grow up? What were some early yeah. influences for you? And then ultimately what led you to your present day career? So maybe tell us a little bit about your background. Sure, sure, sure. Maybe I'll I'll talk first of all, you know, I was, I'm a Filipino. I know this is a podcast thing, but people can get a visual on that. So I was actually born in the Philippines and my parents came over when I was just one year old back in 71. So y'all know how old I am now. (laughs) (laughs) Do the math. But, you know, they came over, actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio came over with four other sisters. So my parents, uh, both uh, born in the Philippines. My dad was a doctor. My mom was uh, basically a homemaker. We all came over. My four older sisters came with. We didn't, of course, I didn't, couldn't speak yet, but didn't know much English at all. Had a lot of relatives in California. So, you know, my parents really are a huge part of who I am. And they brought us over for a better life. My dad knew he wanted a better life for his children. So Came over in 71, lived in a very humble, small apartment in Cleveland, Ohio, eventually. That's where he was doing his most of his studies as a doctor and grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm a big Browns fan, Indians fan, Cavs fan, so if there's any of them out there. But I love to say that I am a fan. So grew up there. My dad is really, you know, he's a doctor, so he's a very hands-on type of guy. My mom a homemaker, but really took care of us. So we're all about family, the family values from my parents. And then, you know, kind of the hands-on and tinkering from my dad led me to really who I am. And part of my story or what I like to say too, is from a diversity point of view, they didn't know much English. And probably back then there wasn't much about diversity and it was hard for them to hard for all of us to grow up there knowing very little English. And I remember a time where even my mother was at the grocery store and knew very little English, very broken English and people laughing at her. And, you know, that made an impression on me about diversity and how not to treat people, I guess. 
but kind of getting a thick skin through that. But I grew up in Cleveland, as I mentioned, and went to Catholic grade school, all girls Catholic high school, really loved getting into chemistry and the sciences and STEM through my dad. And really, that's kind of the start of my career and how I started to love. Didn't know I was going to go into manufacturing back then, really thought I was going to be a doctor just like my dad. But in reality, after I graduated in high school, I decided to take a chemistry degree in pre-med at Purdue University. So I went to Purdue University to get my chemistry degree, met my husband through there. So very, very thankful for Purdue. So any Boilermakers too out there, Boiler Up. So I had a great four and a half years there. Finally graduated back in 92. And, and then my husband actually graduated before me. So about a semester before me. He got into a paint chemical company in Evansville, Indiana. So that was a growing company at the time. So uh, they hired me on as well. So that's really what started my manufacturing career was at a company called Red Spot Paint in Evansville, Indiana. So really started to formulate paint uh, for the automotive industry, did a lot of exterior and interior colorant and using my chemistry background. I did that for about seven years with my husband. And then Toyota came along the Indiana area there. So decided to get into bigger things. And that's when I really got into my automotive career. Loved to problem solve, came in as a quality engineer. So I had responsibility for paints and kind of the, you know, what beautifies the vehicle and um, maybe some sealers, that kind of thing. So did that for a while, started in quality. What I love about Toyota is that they're all about development of people. So worked my way on up to eventually become, go from engineering to management. I really didn't know I wanted to be a manager. I'm a geek at heart. I love data. <laughs> I just love to understand and, and problem solve. But I had a mentor at the time uh, by the name of Sean Suggs. And he saw me working with some team members and he said, Jeanette, what do you think about management? What do you think about working with team members? At first, I'm a very introvert by nature and thought, mm, I don't know, kind of like being with my data and understand and problem solve. Not sure about people, but I'll try. So that's what I decided to do uh, and got promoted through there. Fell in love with working with people. And still had my little introvertness, but again, Toyota loves to develop people, ended up going to a lot of classes to help manage people and leadership, reading a lot of books and navigating through that. Anyways, worked my way through the quality department, eventually became the assistant general manager. And then with my paint background, I moved from quality to production. So they've moved me as a general manager of production. And at that time, my scope became much larger in manufacturing. So I didn't just have engineering, but I had maintenance and production. So really got to see many aspects of the business throughout working with, at that time, was about 800 people. And then really found my love of people going into assembly. So I moved from paint general manager to assembly general manager. And I had both lines at that time, had over 2,000 people. So I was responsible for assembly and also conveyance at the time, production-related maintenance, engineering, and really got into the role of a new model as well. So in Toyota, of course, we, we change our models every uh, six to eight years, depending upon if it's minor or major model change. And had throughout my career, opportunity to go to Japan. So that was great, great development for me. Great to learn a different culture, learn maybe some of the basics of TPS. And really, again, my love of going from problem solving to strategizing to really looking at Toyota as an enterprise rather than just a, an individual shop or plant. And then that was from 2000 to 2018, I was at Toyota Indiana plant growing and having a lot of mentors along the way, also giving back and starting to grow many of the females too. 
I remember the first time I went to Japan, it's kind of like that movie Hidden Figures where you couldn't find a restroom <laughs> anywhere. I think I walked a country mile or two to find a restroom there when I was in Japan and, and really just seeing the, the difference in especially females versus males, how they were treated. And the, honestly, in the Indiana plant, when it started, very few females as well. But myself, along with two other ladies who eventually became the president of Indiana, really helped culminate a little bit more of the female structure. And I helped bring in some of the female nursing stations, for example, and just really starting to grow the female population and being comfortable. I think that's, you know, one of my learning points. And maybe you'll ask me that later, but really just being comfortable with who I am and knowing that there's other females out there that I could help promote and we can all connect with each other through some business partnering groups that we started. Anyway, so that's uh, through 2018. And then I had a great opportunity from 2018 to 2023 recently to start up the new Mazda Toyota plant. It was a brand new joint venture between Mazda and Toyota. So I not only had a Toyota hat, but I had Mazda hat. So half of my brain had to become familiar with Mazda and absolutely loved it. And I love Toyota. I'll do anything for Toyota, but Mazda really taught me many things. So one thing about Mazda that I should tell you all about is that their headquarters is in Japan and it's in Hiroshima. And I think everybody knows what happened at Hiroshima, the bombing, and Mazda was actually, before they became Mazda, was a company that had this, they call it green frame. It's a small three-wheeled vehicle and actually helped through the war. So they have what's called a very challenging spirit through that and really learned about Mazda's challenging spirit. So Mazda and Toyota put together, just created a great combination, learned a lot through them. However, during that time, of course, 2019, 2020 rolled around with COVID and starting up a 6,000 team member plant with brand new equipment, brand new people, brand new models was quite a challenge. So I know I show my black hair, but I did have a lot of gray hair back then. <laughs> because it was many long nights, many intense discussions, getting through COVID, of course, and trying to navigate around the changes that COVID created while starting a brand new company and a brand new workforce. So I did that. I, I was responsible. I was the vice president, eventually became senior vice president of the company and trying to launch two new models at this basically the same time and had a lot of delays because of labor shortages, part shortages, all that kind of great stuff. But we got through it and very proud to say that Mazda Toyota Manufacturing is uh, doing well. And right now, looking at them from a distance, there's so many things that I would change, of course, but I'm very proud of you know starting that up and all the people who have all the jobs that we created in the Huntsville area for them. Then finally, last year, I always say the mothership, which is Toyota Kentucky, called and said there there's an opening for a vice president of manufacturing. So definitely took that opportunity, even though I, I miss Mazda Toyota quite a bit. Of course, gave somebody else the opportunity to uh, be able to run that plant. But coming here to Toyota Kentucky, who has been here for a very long time, I have a lot of great people and one of the first to make an electric vehicle for Toyota in North America. It's really been a great challenge for me. Camry is the bread and butter here. So they've made the Camry for quite some time, started in the 90s and created other vehicles. Right now where we are manufacturing the Camry, the RAV4, and also the Lexus ES 350. And then eventually couple years or so, we will be making the first battery electric vehicle. So great opportunity. This company is expanding, is changing. There's so much more new innovation. And I like to tell the engineers, it's like a kid at a candy store. There's so, so much innovation and change. And usually Toyota Kentucky is one of the first plants. Anybody has ideas. We're the first ones to kind of experiment and start them. So very, very, very fortunate to be here at Lexington now. So I went from Evansville, Indiana 
to Huntsville, Alabama, and now I'm here in Lexington, Kentucky. That is an impressive career so far. <laughs> Jeanette, you still have more to come, right? So, um, Yes, ma'am. As, as you talk about your journey, that's I love how you first got introduced through your spouse and through that first introduction to manufacturing and a company. And now, holy cow, 20 some years later, still <laughs> the history and with Toyota is really impressive. So I'm sure there've been lots of lessons learned along oh, the way yes. and some challenges, any major experiences that were maybe challenges that you overcame that would lend some guidance to our listeners or, you know, sure. advice that you navigated these 20 plus years. Sure. I have what I call my alive for five. <laughs> there are kind of five firing phrases that I've learned throughout my career based on four very influential females in my life. The last one is something that I created, but I always like to teach these to, especially to the newer females, because it is very intimidating, of course, in a male dominating work field. And a lot of the gentlemen that I work with are very good and they are promoters and advocates for females, but these ladies definitely inspired me. First is, her name is Susan Elkington. So she is now the executive vice president. She is over all of the battery electric, but she also started in Indiana. She was a single mother of two and uh, was an engineer that started, but she and I have a saying that became a kind of a phrase once she decided to go to Japan. She was the first female executive to actually have a intercompany transfer. We call it ICT in Japan. And the phrase is, if not you, then who? And during the time, you know, Susan and I were talking right before she left and a lot of apprehension, a lot of feeling very nervous. And is this the right thing to do? And, and I told her that she is absolutely the right person to do this. She is an inspiring lady. Like I said, a single mom for quite some time, eventually got married, but really one of the first females to kind of pave the way in manufacturing for us. And she did a lot for us while she was in Japan. She was there, I think, for about three, three or four, maybe even five years, but really paved the way for the females. And, I, you know, that phrase always comes back. If not you, Susan, then who's going to do it? And ever since then, of course, she progressed in her career. She's younger than me, too. So <laughs> it's it's just so inspiring to see and how she navigates towards so many of the challenges. And she's so dang smart and uh, sees things differently and always is a promoter from the diversity, from the female point of view. So if not you, then who? That's one of the, the phrases that she taught me. And the second one comes from another wonderful lady. Her name is uh, Leah Curry. She's now retired, but she was the president of Toyota Indiana, started out as a maintenance lady. And she always told me, Jeanette, you need to try to fail forward. And when she first told me that, I'm like, what do you mean? Nobody likes to fail, you know, but really it's, it's about taking risks being comfortable to take risks and being comfortable for maybe not totally succeeding and learning from it. So I love that phrase because it keeps you from being scared to take a leap of faith in what you're doing. And, you know, with, with Leah and, and Susan both, they were always supportive. So even if it was an issue and maybe I didn't do so well, they were always there to support me and and I would always learn from it. And what's great about Toyota, too, is that they have a kind of a mantra of PDCA, plan, do, check, act. And through that, the act portion is reflection, and how you can do things better. So that's kind of the fail forward point of view is that if you succeed, you still reflect and you can improve. But even if, you're, if you failed or something went wrong, you need to learn from it. And you need to keep going. So that's what I get from Miss Leah. Now she's enjoying some grandbabies right now. So happy for her. Another advocate of females and a huge part of female manufacturing DNA is Millie Marshall. And she also is retired. So, but she was the West Virginia president. She was the Indiana president. And she started in IT. So she really didn't start in manufacturing. But, you know, through the development of Toyota, 
really worked her way up towards that. And she came up with this really interesting acronym, Q-TIP. And I remember one of the first times I heard that from her. Actually, I didn't hear it from her. She handed me a Q-TIP after one of my presentations. And I thought, what is this about? Is she trying to make me clean out my ears? Am I not listening? What's this all about? But it was a symbolic. And she said, Jeanette, you know, sometimes when you go through whatever you're going through and you get some feedback, you can't take it personal. So Q-tip means quit taking it personal. And I know from a female point of view, we take things very personally. And it's because we're passionate and it's okay that we're passionate. And it's okay. Maybe sometimes you take things personally, but you can't dwell on it and you got to move on. So I always say that when I I see a lot of these females getting frustrated or upset at themselves. I have by myself, I didn't bring any, but I usually have Q-tips in my pocket (laughs) and I hand it to them. And I go through the same kind of coaching lesson with them. Quit taking it personally, dust off your boots, grab your bootstraps and move on. That's a Q-tip from Millie. Maybe the next one, part of my number four of my Alive for Five comes from my mother. So my mother... She raised actually eventually six children. I have a a little brother too. So there's five girls and one boy. And my mother loved her raising us children. My dad and her would go to Las Vegas and she loved the slot machines. And she loved, loved, loved to bet the slot machines. So one day I sat next to her and played slot machine. I put a quarter in and thought I won the jackpot because, you know, lights were flashing or whatever. Uh, But I only put one quarter in and I think I ended up winning only 10 bucks. (laughs) And she looked at me and she shook her head and she said, Jeanette, you should have bet the maximum. And in her Filipino way of saying it, she would say, always bet max. And if I would have bet max, then I would have won $10,000. But I did bet max. And uh, from that, I've always known my mother to go all in. And, you know, she went all in by taking all of us little girls 8,000 miles from the Philippines to the United States during what she did to to grow us up in a maybe not so friendly, diverse neighborhood. But she did everything all in. So I always like to tell people, go all in. You revert back to Leah's failing forward. Maybe you'll fail here and there, but you, you got to just learn from it and get through. So That's what she taught me. Always bet max. And my last one really is just after all, you know, all these wonderful women who have taught me one thing that I've taught myself is to start getting comfortable being uncomfortable. So I mentioned earlier that I'm an introvert by nature, but I have to be an extrovert in certain times. You know, this is one of them. And speaking to usually I have to speak in front of hundreds of people and, you know, in, in front of some of my team members. And you just, you have to start getting comfortable. And maybe some of the ways of getting comfortable is through practice. You know, before this meeting, I looked through my notes and I made sure that, uh, you know, I was prepared. So being prepared is very important, but you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable too, and how to navigate around some of that uncomfortable feeling that you might have and getting yourself out of your comfort zone. So anyways, Long story short, that is my Alive for Five that I I love to teach other ladies and some gentlemen too, based on what I have learned in the past. And hopefully it'll accelerate their learning. It's taken me this long to learn it, but a lot of other great females out there who are just starting their careers, probably going through the same thing, especially if you're a, a working mom, should have mentioned that I have three wonderful children and a wonderful husband, of course, and my three kids. I have two boys and a girl and two grandbabies. So, you know, navigating my career with the kids too was not easy, but through these ladies in my life and a lot of the mentors been able to navigate through it. So, Well, that is some amazing advice. I love, I love these. I'm going to steal these. and, and <laughs> steal away. I, I love fail forward and Q-tip. I think it's so applicable to so many of our listeners, I'm sure. And I know me too. I think a lot of us tend and trend towards taking things personally when um, we shouldn't in many instances. And I love the always bet max and go all in. And if not you, then who I often say that team members to people 
who have this apprehension about taking a risk or going for something. If not you, then who? I love that as well. And getting comfortable, being uncomfortable, I think is a really good life lesson and a good piece of advice. So as you have had this very experienced career, I know last year we were so excited to have inducted you into our Women in Manufacturing Hall of Fame. And very that celebrated you for all of that you've done to support, promote, and inspire women in industry. Could you share a little bit about how you felt receiving this honor and what it meant to you? Wow. First of all, uh, one of the team members at Mazda Toyota told me she had nominated me and I was just floored. Her, her name is Helen and she's one of the team leaders uh, in conveyance. And, you know, Helen has her own story and really needed some inspiration and female advice. So I'd always been her mentor. And when she told me that, and then later I found out that I was I was nominated and awarded, I it's about the Helens out there for me. And one of the things that I wanted to do, one of the rea- first reactions I had is, oh, I'm so honored. It's so awesome. But I really wanted to take many of the Mazda Toyota females with me to the award ceremony because it was it was about them and and I'm not trying to be all humble and all that great stuff it really was it was the award was for them because they're the ones who inspired me especially at Mazda Toyota where it was a, a brand new company and I had to start from scratch I was you know the second person in the company and now 6,000 people later having the intentional plan to start up the company with many of these females and starting the company with the tools and the camaraderie and the collaboration for females. It was all about them. So we had picked maybe about 15 females. It was hard to pick because I wanted to bring them all. (laughs) 15 females to come and to see their smiles and to be able to go. It was in uh, San San Diego at the time for them to be able to get out of the plant and actually go through some of the seminars, meet a lot of other females going through the same thing. For me, that's what it was all about. I mean, I love the awards and I love the award ceremony and learning some of the other females that were in my class, but to see their faces and to be able to take them out of the plant and reward them because of all their hard work, all of what they've endured, and to meet other females, that, that's really what it was all about for me. And I understand this year, there's another nominee, maybe later on, that'll be announced within the Toyota realms. But anyways, I'm I'm just so happy that I can give back to them. And maybe that's, I have a live for five, but maybe that's number six is giving back (laughs) so that they can proliferate and more and more uh, other females to come at Mazda Toyota and Toyota. So I love that. I love as you shared, you know, it's about... When any of us are celebrated, it's not just us, as you said, there's some people that that helped us get to that point of yeah. all these people that are inspiring you still to do that yeah. you're doing. And, you know, I love that you brought a great group of people to our summit and we're seeing more and more women in production coming to our annual conference, which so yeah. excites me because those yeah. are those that probably need our support most or yes. in a greater way. So absolutely. You know, able to bring them to San Diego. And I hope this year in Boston, we'll see even more, you know, women in production yeah. meeting in our, our tracks and our conference sessions. Yeah. And you guys have no idea what kind of impact that has. I mean, the summit itself is wonderful, but to be able to take a female that has never been even outside of, in this case, in Huntsville, never even flew a plane, went over there, met other females, you know, and knew that other females were going through the same thing. I mean, they still have connections with other ladies that they met over there. And we still talk about it now and, you know, taking what they learned from the summit and implementing, I think Rosie, the Riveter, I think was a big something that, you know, we got out of that. And actually after the, after the summit, they presented as Rosie, the Riveter's to the officers and now have a they have a program where when new females come to the company they greet them and they're called rosies so out out of your summit that's you know that's what came out of that so I, i think it's fantastic you know there's the benefit of 
the summit to them personally, but then as a company, we were able to benefit from it too. So. I love it. That's wonderful to hear. So we always end our episodes and discussions with women in industry um, with you mm-hmm. sharing your best piece of advice. And I feel like you've already given us tons of nuggets of <laughs> takeaways, but if there's any final piece of advice that you might want to give to our audience that you've either received oh. personally or professionally, we'd love to have yeah. you share that now. Well, thank you. Wow. I think the only other thing left to say is that I wish I would have known this much earlier, but really being your authentic self and being comfortable with who you are. And I think that takes a lot of support from other females in the organization, your company, being able to show who you are and be comfortable with that. Um, But then also learning from the company. As I said, Toyota's been fantastic to me about growth. And I mentioned, you know, when I When I grew up, I was number five of the five girls. So, you know, I was the lowest in the pecking order. (laughs) Let's say, you know, I'd get all the hand-me-downs. I'd learn from my sisters. So it wasn't natural for me to be a leader, honestly. I was always kind of a follower because I was number five. But what's funny is that it's my sisters now, you know, they've seen me and they've heard me and they know about my career path and they call me leadership all the time. It's, it's kind of a, wow. a family, family thing. Whenever events happen, like my, my parents' 25th anniversary, I kind of planned it all out. And they, anytime there's anything going on, they, they always call me, Jeanette, how would you do this? How would you plan this? <laughs> so <laughs> it's really awesome to have been able to grow my career, but then, you know, still be myself. Cause uh, like I said, I'm still an introvert and I know how to manage things to be my authentic self and be comfortable with who I am. And I think that's, you know, if I were to give any advice to the females out there, be comfortable with who you are. If you're going to cry, cry, cry it out. I've cried so many times um, throughout my career. Just know that there are other females out there that are willing to be your mentor and willing to help support. And through whim definitely and through the summit you'll find other females out there that are in the same boat as you and just connect through them so i love it well jeanette it has been such a pleasure to talk with you well, today thank you, allison you are excellent and you always inspire me and i look forward to sharing this episode with our audience and we will definitely have to stay connected awesome. um, again thanks for being a part of hear her story thank you thank you allison Love what you all do and uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you for listening to Hear Her Story, a podcast produced by the Women in Manufacturing Association. Be sure to share, review, and subscribe to Hear Her Story on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen.